My name is Jim Winkler, as you heard, Vice President for Economic Growth at Creative Associates International. I want to take this opportunity to thank Saif and Nabil and Dina, the entire team from ENCC, for hosting this, sponsoring it, and bringing together such an illustrious group of participants. The topic that we're talking about, blended finance, uh, the three previous speakers gave us a great setup for me to introduce it. Um, for me, blended finance is like music. I grew up in a European household in America, and everyone had to learn an instrument. I played the trumpet. We had violins, we had all kinds of musicians, pianists, flutists, um, cellists, and if you go to the symphony and all you hear is a drum beat, it's okay, but you need to bring in the violins and the cellos and the drums and the percussion and the baritones and all of the instruments to have beautiful music. And one of the key actors is the conductor of the orchestra. You need a catalyst. And I think the music metaphor is great for what we just heard from Dr. Ziad. It really is about partnership. That the key actors in any society all have a role and have to be brought together in order to create a low cost, low risk business enabling environment. If I were to summarize everything I heard this morning, it's, it's too high cost, it's too risky, and in fact, I think, say if you told me this morning that the informal economy is as big, maybe larger than the formal economy. What does that tell you? It tells you that we're driving out all the businesses or would-be entrepreneurs because it's too costly and too risky to operate according to the rules that are established right now. And so that tells us we need to really think differently about how do we organize our economy. And Blended finance is complementary to that because we can deploy blended finance in any environment. You'll hear from my colleague Charles Paulette a little bit later about how we do it in West Africa, from the most conflict difficult environment in Burkina Faso or Mali, right? To, I was in Ukraine two weeks ago. I presented blended finance to the Ukraine Venture Capital Association. You think there's only war? There's life and their investors and their people trying to invest there. And they said, this is exactly what we need. Because essentially what we're talking about is de-risking you know, the private sector so they can invest today, not in two months or two years or 20 years when we get everything perfect, all the prices right, all the regulations right. No, we can actually de-risk investment for local, regional, and international actors to invest today. And so that means that we need to bring all the actors together. You talked about government earlier, a very important player. Government has done a few things, I understand, like the Egypt COP fund, trying to partner with Avance and um, MGM, I heard from one of our colleagues at Sid Consulting, that uh, is an effort to try to get the government involved in reducing the carbon footprint. So government has a role. We have bilateral donors, USAID, one of, our, one of our closest clients worldwide who's sitting here, plays a very important role. Phil, um, foundations, philanthropies, companies that do corporate social responsibility and donate funding to try to help in the social sectors. They provide critical grants. I call it unrestricted capital. That is the most valuable capital because it's flexible and it's a first mover and you can use it to leverage all kinds of debt and equity financing. So it, in this presentation, it, it will get kind of technical because uh, we often talk to bankers and finance experts, but I'll try to make it as accessible as possible because it really is about getting the right music and we need the conductor of the orchestra. And so different people play that role of conductor. You know, we need the development finance institutions. 
We need the multilateral development banks. We need the asset owners. Who are the asset owners? By the way, can I have a mic, if you could bring up a microphone? Because you've heard of TED Talks. I was going to give you a gym talk, but I need a microphone to do that. So if you could bring up a microphone, I'd appreciate it. But uh, the asset owners are the pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and the insurance companies. They're the ones that own all the assets. We have to figure out how to de-risk their investment so that they can deploy it into the marketplace. So on this first slide, I can control it. Okay. On the first slide here, you'll see that, let's get the big picture. On the far left, there is an estimate of 3.1 trillion with a T, trillion dollars. That is the gap in financing what we need to achieve in implementing the sustainable development goals. That's a huge gap. Where are we gonna get that money from? Well, the numbers here show us, I have to hold two. Uh, for the translator, sorry about that. So you'll see here in the middle column that uh, the US and EU, the rich countries, so to speak, they're not doing so great in terms of their own budgeting and their own financing. They have limited funds. They are donating and providing foreign aid. You know what American people think is the amount of the federal budget going to foreign aid? They think it's 25%, completely wrong, less than 1%. So there's misconception politically and in reality, there's not enough money for Europe and the United States to finance all the needs of the, uh, of the countries that are poor or struggling and trying to really advance. So that's a challenge. They all need to get their government credit ratings as high as they can. Finally, on the far right, you see where all the money is. It's with the asset owners, the sovereign wealth funds, the, um, the insurance companies, the um, asset owners. And they have 145 trillion with a T. That's where all the money is, right? And the question is, they're not going to invest in these environments in Egypt, for example, much less Ukraine, unless they have investable opportunities. And that's what this is all about. We, can, we have to work at, as we heard earlier, at getting the enabling environment right. Absolutely. I came here in 2009 or 10 with a Vietnamese delegation to learn about Irada. You remember that? The recent prime minister, Nguyen Xuan Phuc, I worked with him and a team, and they eventually re eliminated 500,000 regulations. Fantastic. That's an FDI-driven model for growth in Vietnam. They moved from the poorest country in the world in 1994 to where they were importing rice to the number one exporter of rice in the world. How did they do that? They got prices right. Peter Timmer, the ag economist, who Ali, one of my colleagues, Ali Kamal, sitting here, um, said, I took his course, Peter Timmer at Harvard. Get the prices right, get the market right. And you need that partnership between government and the private sector to get everything right so the market is for functioning. So this slide really tells you that we're not going to get all the donor money that we need to finance the $3.1 trillion in gap funding every year to fill that gap. So how are we going to do it? That's what this discussion is about. So blended finance, let's start with a definition. On the far left, on both of your screens, you'll see that Convergence, which is a trade association of all the blended finance organizations, companies, private investors, equity investors, and so forth, has this definition. Using capital from catalytic capital is a term, a spark plug that starts the engine, right? Catalytic. From the public or philanthropic resources to incentivize and de-risk private capital for development. OECD has a similar, similar explanation. And you see the key concept that we have up here is leverage. USAID for many years has talked about global development alliances, working with the private sector, and it was a cost share model. So if a company, whoever it is, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Nestle, if you put $1 million in, USAID will put $1 million, and we have $2 million to work with. What we're doing in West Africa, and what we need to be doing, and what blended finance enables, is one to five minimum for every one dollar of concessional public money, grant money, USAID grant money or 
philanthropic money. We need to get a minimum of $5, and I think we can get $20. We have cases, Charles will share with you, that are 15 to 20 times $1 you begin to get the multipliers in the private capital and leveraging it, bringing it into the economy and all of the industries that have growth opportunities that becomes a multiplier effect in the economy. And then we're looking for impact, right, and returns. You can't just have social impact without a sustainable return on investment for the investors because they won't come into, our, into Egypt or any country, not the U.S., anywhere. They don't get those returns. And so what we're looking for is job creation. Every politician in the world, I don't care where they live, Tokyo, Washington, Cairo, needs to generate jobs and livelihoods or they're out of business eventually. The Vietnamese open their economy from a communist system, controlled pricing to a market system because they're gonna go out of business. They created jobs, they created livelihoods. They got the market working. So you have to create jobs and you have to create exports. You have to have a competitive economy. We heard really good presentation earlier about export competitiveness drives your growth. The other thing though is on the bottom is the returns. You have to have the financial returns as I said for any of your investors to come in in the first place and to not just do it one time with de-risking tools that we use from catalytic capital but for them to do it second, third, fourth, fifth time. So the multipliers and the sustainability is critical. Now, I ask myself, can we get more than this leverage of 20 to 1, 1 to 20? I'm talking to a company now based out of the United States, out of Kansas City, who was referred to me by a friend at the International Finance Corporation. And this company will do this year $130 billion in supply chain financing. They have a digital platform where they qualify buyers, large companies, Carrefour, Nestle, Pepsi, Coke, whoever, on their platform, and they will at one half of 1% discounted factoring invoices for the entire supply chain, anyone in the supply chain of those buyers. This is phenomenal. They do 50 million transactions each day, every single day, for over 500,000 suppliers in the countries they work with. Where do they work? They work in the developed markets. Where do I want them to work? Here in Egypt. We're talking to them about putting the platform here in Egypt, getting buyers registered on the platform through their own due diligence, every invoice issued to any of their suppliers through agriculture, through retailers, big box retailers, whoever, can have financing you know, um, made available instead of 30, 60, 90 days tomorrow, like that. That is phenomenal because you're injecting liquidity into the marketplace, and right now we're starving the marketplace, right? It's like not having enough oxygen and not enough gas in your engine. So the spark plug is at catalytic capital. You need to get enough investment going in, enough oxygen and liquidity in the marketplace so your engine of the economy starts running. So that's what this slide is all about. It's leverage. So aid is changing its business model. One of the partners is saying, what does Samantha Power say, the administrator in Washington? Private sector-led development. Not just in economic areas, in all areas, in education, in healthcare, in productive sectors, everywhere in the economy. And then the other thing she's talking about is localization. How do we work with local actors? And one of the most important local actors is everyone here in the room, and it's also the companies, the micro, small, medium enterprises that are the guts of the economy. 98, 99% of this economy and any economy in the world is made up of micro, small, and medium enterprises, right? I think we all know that, but that's where we have to see where we're gonna get the results. So this slide here talks about how we can get co-investors to invest in local firms to generate long-term impact, right? We're trying to get them to invest into investable projects that are really gonna generate results for micro, small, medium, the entire supply chain and across the economy. So you'll see the box in the middle is the dynamism of the economy. Investment goes to reinvestment, goes to capitalizing and recapitalizing, just like that company I mentioned out of the US. They can do 50 million transactions a day. That's what you need in an economy, it's like magic. 
You know, there's no one conducting the economy like an or orchestra conductor. It happens because the prices are working, the legislation is working, the system is working, and you get the investment and the dynamism going on in the economy. So the key is local firms for that localization in key sectors and regions that maybe you can't reach on a purely commercial basis. So we can de-risk investors to go into those sectors of the economy or regions that we want to reach, government and the private sector and philanthropies. We want to reach new areas. The other thing that was mentioned earlier is climate. Climate is existential for us. This is not just a woke liberal agenda. It is critical for businesses to operate more efficiently, sustainably, and sustainability, by the way, is profit. First, if they don't make a profit, they're, not, they're gonna go out of business. Second is people. They have to look after people, their own employees, their con consumers, their communities that they operate in. And the third is planet. That's the environment they operate in. If we all don't take responsibility for preserving the environment that we are living in, investing in, and educating our children in for their future, there's no future for them. So this is not just a nice thing to talk about or a nice thing to have. It's critical that we target sectors of the economy where we're really going to bring about the reduction in carbon and greenhouse effects that is really eroding the viability of our planet to live on. So business, self-enlightened business, knows this, and they are bringing in business models FinTech, Agritech, EdTech. We heard examples last week. The Africa Venture Capital Association was in the Four Seasons Hotel. We have three of our partners, impact investors, venture capital investors from West Africa were there. We went and met with them, talked about, hey, are you guys interested in investing here in Egypt? Absolutely. And they told us about new education technology that they are seeing in the marketplace here that they want to invest in. Agri cultural technology that they want to invest in because it's a game changer in terms of getting the productivity, the return on investment, the yields that they're aspiring to get. So the purpose you heard earlier from our former premiers in this country who know very well that competitiveness is absolutely crucial. Competitiveness is at the enterprise level, it's at the sector level, it's at the national level. And critical to competitiveness is education of our youth. They are our workers. We want them to know how to think, how to think abstractly, how to pro solve problems. So education and technology, how many people in the crowd are economists? I study economics and business. What are the two things that shift the growth curve? Technology and education. You want to really shift your performance in the economy? Those are the two, two th things we have to hit. And that's what this allows us to hit. We have to get scale. We have to get investments that are going to reach and achieve greater capacity in our supply chains, all the way up and down the supply chains. We need to get bigger fleets, new products. We need to improve competitiveness, which we just talked about, at micro levels and across the entire economy. We need to accelerate investments that might take two or three or five years to happen. We need it now or in six months or in 12 months, not in three years or five years or 10 years. So acceleration is a key part of blended financing. And I mentioned geographic reach going into regions that is, are completely left out of the economy. That's where our youth, our communities are left behind. They're not involved. We can reach them by de-risking investment into those sectors in agriculture, in uh, extending internet access. Microsoft announced at the US Africa Business Summit last July the um, Brad Smith, the vice chairman, said, Microsoft is committed to increasing 100 million people to get on the internet with content in the next two years. So that's part of their core business. That is enlightened self-interest. Why are they doing it? Because their business model is about how, how, how do people be on the internet, benefit from the internet, and of course, buy products and services that they provide. But this is where business has to be part of the solution working with government, working with ph philanthropies to find out these solutions. The final thing on this slide is eventuality, which means that, you know, eventually that uh, new factory might happen or this investment might happen, but if you have to go through all the 
you know, uh, hurdles of legislation, all the requirements or feasibility studies, studies, it can take too long. And so blended finance can accelerate that process where we can take catalytic capital and work with debt and equity financiers on specific projects to bring in processing that maybe never existed here in particular commodities in Egypt that will increase value addition and increase jobs and employment and profitability for companies. So now we go to the export sector. This is a very quick and analytical look at the sectors. I'm not gonna go through all of them. You all probably know them better than I do. do. There are a lot in agriculture and manufacturing and services. But we see the total exports in 2021 is 40, almost $45 billion and the addressable market if we take out parts of the economy that philanthropies or USAID or some of the DFIs won't invest in. So it's still $28, million, $28 billion. And that's where export competitiveness is key. You cannot drive export competitiveness without private capital. And let me make one very important point. Capital is not just about money. Capital is about what it all brings together. It brings management, it brings know-how, brings market access, that means networks into buyers, suppliers, standards, manufacturing practices, safety, workforce development. It's all wrapped into the capital. So when we talk about catalytic capital generating private capital, realize it's not just about the money. It's much more than the money. It's the technology and all the things I just mentioned that are so critical to be able to compete regionally and internationally. And that's why bringing in, attracting in international companies that do operate locally, they have to have local supply chains. Multinational companies, US, European companies, they have to work through the local supply chains in order for them to be competitive inside Egypt for goods and services that they want to sell here and to export out of Egypt. So the export competitiveness, we heard this earlier in the talks, totally agree. This is a critical area that we would focus on as key sectors to drive the economy. So this slide is showing you six different kinds of capital and um, that gets deployed into the marketplace from asset-based lending on the top there, on the left part of the screen, down to common equity. We use unrestricted capital, grant money, you'll see examples later, to catalyze all of those different kinds of capital to make sure that they have better risk profiles, de-risk their investments, or to make the terms more flexible, more attractive for them, or to increase their growth rates. So you'll hear from Charles some of the transactions, that's where the nut gets cracked. It's great to talk in generalities, but it's deal by deal, transaction by transaction, company or investor by investor. What does it take to get them to come in and invest? At a minimum, one to five. Preferably one to 20 or one to 50. I think we can even get higher. We can get that company out of the US that does supply chain financing to come to Egypt. So the process for managing the partnership with those investors has a number of steps that we go through. We screen the co-investors and projects for target sectors that are priorities for the government, for the philanthropies, for USAID, and for those of us who think that's how the country is really gonna grow. Export sectors are very important. Agriculture is gonna be really important. Renewable energy, water, climate-related issues. The Red Sea is a huge issue here in uh, Egypt, how to revitalize that, even make it grow, because that's a critical attraction and asset for tourism and for the nature to be you know, healthy. So we go through that exercise. We also look for not the old risk, not the old way of doing things. A really good co-investment project team is gonna be always looking at what we call novelty risk, pushing out on the frontier of risk. That's where we wanna be. We don't wanna check the box and say, oh, we did an investment and we helped 10,000 farmers. Well, what about helping 10 million farmers? How do we get there? We can, if we're smart enough and we work with the people who are really smart, they're the investors, venture capitalists, angel investors. You walk into a room with them and you're blown away by all the ideas that they're thinking about. And they're there and they're available. So we wanna align the co-investments with the mission funders objectives, USAIDs or Philanthropies, Sawiris Foundation and others, so that we're not just 
randomly going after different investors, there's a logic, there's a strategy to it, to the growth of the country. Ensure potential for replication, replicability is really important, sustainability, replicability, and, and um, what's the third one? Scalability. All of those are critical factors that we look for. And this dynamic of cash recycling, you know, for long-term impacts that go way beyond what our catalytic capital will do on one transaction is really important. How we see that happening in the economy and in the marketplace. So I'm almost finished. Um, here's a slide that looks at each of the different levels of uh, partners that we work with and what are their pain points, financial and technical pain points that we try to address. And that's really important when you go transaction by transaction to understand that, have a dialogue with them about that, and to try to de-risk and address some of those issues. So for the fund investors, for impact investors, private equity, they go out and try to raise capital, right, from private investors, from the sovereign wealth funds, from the uh, insurers and the ones that have the assets. You have to go out and de-risk their co-investors' capital in a fund so they can pass their internal rate of returns. We have to make sure that they're going to get the returns in order to attract them to come in. There are other things we do on a technical side in terms of fund registration, marketing, tactical things that they need in order to attract the fund, the big funds to invest into an impact fund or a private equity fund. We work a lot with those kinds of funds because they get multipliers and leverage much greater than a one by one company engagement. The second category is portfolio managers. How do we work with them to deal with write-offs, losses, right? Portfolio at risk standards that they want to achieve. Currency costs in order for them to get their internal rate of returns. And we can do things like help them on rollouts. You know, how do they get the right talent, templates for processing, and systems that they need to just activate and get their funds going. And then finally, when we're looking at, you know, investing down market into the micro and small and medium enterprises, when you're talking with, about larger companies, how do we de-risk de their investment into the SMEs? There are going to be some losses. We can set up first losses or capabilities to de-risk those losses. So you'll see on the right side this graphic. In developed economies, the risk premium you know, for that kind of a market environment is about 8 to 9 percent. But you add in the other risks, perceived or real, that are the business environment, the currency risk, the political risk. All of these factors add up risk so that you're talking about 12 to 19 percent risk in, on top of the cost of capital. And that means that you're talking about very high costs for investors to come in. We can de-risk all of those and we can target those specific challenges that they have so that they're motivated to come into a market. So key takeaways about blended finance. We can help make firms attractive to key investors. We can de-risk the investor's appetite and adjusted returns so that it's attractive for them to come into Egypt and into specific parts of the economy where they're going to make money. That's really critical. Second takeaway, in the medium and long term, private investors can help firms to be market competitive, increase sales, create jobs. Our top line targets for a blended finance project in West Africa and in here in Egypt or any country would be private capital leveraged, right? For the amount of money that we're going to deploy from philanthropies or USAID or any donor, 1 to 20. We have 1 to 8 on average in West Africa. It can be higher than that. It, and I think if that's what you're driving at, that's important, but that's not the only met metric. Second one is creating jobs. Critical, right? Third one is export sales and overall sales. That's what gets the economy going. And that's what drives it and sustains it. And finally, public-private partnerships, right? That is key. We heard about it at different levels. One is the government and the private sector in dialogue. That, that is really critical so the government understands what does it take to create the enabling environment and change policies or regulations that make it a more friendly, lower cost, lower risk environment overall. But we don't have to wait for the perfect enabling environment. We can invest today 
with blended finance with this model applied so that those public-private partnerships can scale the results we're looking for. And so it's not just doing one or two partnerships a year. We, we did 90 in three years in West Africa. So that was version 1.0. Version 2.0 in Egypt, I bet we could do better than that. We moved from six to 12 months to process a deal to three to six months through efficiencies of how we work with private companies, private investors and impact funds. And so we're getting smarter at how to do this. Aid is getting smarter. Philanthropies are getting smarter. So we're more like a speedboat, right? How do we deploy and drop into the marketplace 90 co-investment transactions that demonstrate a completely different way of operating because of the technology deployed, because of the know-how, the workforce development, the sales, the quality of the products, the exports that can be generated, the value addition, all of that is key in how we activate the economy. And working with our partners at ENCC and other trade associations to promote that. We had a case in West Africa, I call it investment-led regulatory reform. Our biggest transaction, Charles will show you, is uh, setting up a new processing plant for the first time in West Africa. And they ran into a problem with the government where they wanted the plant built 150 miles away from the port. They said, that's too expensive. The transportation costs and transaction costs of building that processing plant 150 miles away is a no-go for us. We spent about eight months delayed final startup for construction of the processing plant for cashews. Took eight months, but we got the U.S. ambassador, U.S. embassy, U.S. aid folks helped, our team helped, the CEO and staff of the company helped, talked to the Ministry of Finance, talked to the Ministry of Agriculture, talked to the Ministry of Transportation, talked to the export processing zone, and got people to understand, and they finally issued a construction permit and all the environmental and related permits to build it close to the port. So that's one transaction that's going to have real results, Charles will show you, but more importantly, I think there are going to be 5, 10, 20, 50 other companies that see that investment flag of Red River Food that's now processing cashews, and they'll say, hey, we'll go in there too. We're going to follow. You know, the first mover is really important. So that's where the catalytic capital is so important for individual transactions, for demonstration effects, and for multipliers in the economy that transform the way we think ourselves about what's possible. And people see that, they relate to it, and they copy it, they replicate it. So some of the investments we did in West Africa, as I said, I think they're going to be replicated here in Egypt. And I think we're going to be able to do new things here that we didn't do in West Africa because we may have a more enlightened set of partners that say, hey, we can do education technology to educate our kids and do after-school programming and teacher education and other stuff that can be done by the private sector, maybe faster, maybe more efficiently. And we can do technology applied in financial applications like that company out of the U.S. that can do 50 million transactions a day. Those are the game changers that we're looking for when we look for catalytic capital to really leverage private capital. So that's blended finance. So next time you hear a symphony playing a beautiful piece, sonata or whatever, and you close your eyes, you don't see the orchestra actually playing. You don't see the conductor gesticulating to try to get all of the horns and the string instruments and the baritones playing the right music, but you hear beautiful music. That's what we're looking for here in Egypt. Beautiful music through that partnership. Shukran.